Hello and welcome to an episode where we will discuss the question of inclusion for persons with disabilities. Today we are going to specifically discuss about the role of institutions in inclusion of disabled. I am Professor Archana Dasi, a social work professional for the last 30 years with specialization in gender, disability and marginalized communities. I have been teaching in the department of social work, Jamia Millia Islamia, New Delhi and also actively working with various government and non-government organizations. Let us start today's episode by outlining the objectives of the lesson which include the role of institutions in the inclusion of disabled, the link between poverty and disability, barriers to inclusion which include attitudinal barriers, environmental barriers, institutional barriers, communication barriers, interaction between impairment and barriers, a twin track approach as adopted by UNRWA and right based approach to disability inclusion. Persons with disabilities are one of the largest minority group in the world, estimated to represent over 15 percent approximately 1.5 billion people of the world's population. Three out of five persons with disability are women and disability is more common among children and adults who are poor. Persons with disabilities face challenges to fully participate in society which is further heightened by discriminatory social attitudes. This culminates in the marginalization and significant barriers to their inclusion and participation in society and in development. The extent of inequalities experienced by persons with disabilities in all areas of development is often the result of shortcomings in the structural, social, political and cultural environments in which they reside, including lack of accessibility of physical and virtual environments, institutional and attitudinal barriers, exclusion and unequal opportunities. The achievement of the sustainable development goals that is the SDGs relies on the involvement and inclusion of persons with disabilities in all the developmental efforts. As a universal call to action, the 17 SDGs are interconnected and require governments to take a holistic approach to development. The pledge to leave no one behind in our in development efforts and reach the furthest behind first is fundamental to supporting persons with disabilities. Now persons with disabilities and UNDP. Now United Nations development program you know it talks about persons with disability are often left out of the development processes and development progress. UNDP is committed to an inclusive approach to sustainable human development which benefits all and ensures that no one is left behind. UNDP has a strong and institutional commitment to mainstream human rights including the rights of persons with disability in our work through human rights based approach to our development programming. The inclusion of persons with disabilities in our work is also instrumental to the uh, achievement of you know human development and the uh, sustainable development goals. UNDP recognizes the centrality of human rights to sustainable development poverty alleviation and ensuring a fair distribution of development opportunities and benefits. UNDP is committed to supporting universal respect for and observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms for all.
Now, UNDP strategic plan which came in 2018-21 aims to support countries in addressing development challenges and recognizes that a set of core development needs underpin those challenges including the need to strengthen gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls and to ensure the protection of human rights. In 2015, UNDP adopted social and environmental standards which apply to all UNDP programs and projects and include an overarching principle in UNDP's work to apply a human rights based approach to our development programming. That means that development programs and policies should further the realization of human rights as laid down in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other human rights instruments. As a development branch of the UN system, UNDP supports member states as they seek to achieve the SDGs by 2030 and fulfill their human rights obligations under the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities CRPD as we do so through a human right based approach to our programming. The CRPD and the SDGs are the twin frameworks which are uh, mutually reinforcing and within which UNDP supports disability inclusive development. SDGs reflect the pledge to leave no one behind in our development efforts and to reach the furthest behind first. People get left behind when they lack the choices and opportunities and participate in and benefit from the development progress. Those who experience disadvantage, who cannot realize their rights and have limitations to their choices and opportunities relative to others in society are at the risk of being left behind. Unfortunately, as the world's largest minority group, persons with disability have been consistently left behind in development gains and in their participation in development processes. Now, persons with disabilities and their representative organizations should therefore be actively engaged in our efforts to support the SDGs not only as a group that has been consistently left behind, but also as invaluable partners in the efforts towards inclusion. The CRPD was adopted by the General Assembly in 2006 and entered into force in 2008. It is the first core human rights treaty of 21st century and is legally binding to member states who are state parties. Currently 177 member states are there together with the protocol uh, of the CRPD which has 92 member states as state parties. It forms the normative framework to address the rights of persons with disabilities and to ensure that they are included in all development efforts. The overarching goal of the CRPD is to ensure equality and non-discrimination and in the realization of the rights of persons with disabilities. The CRPD outlines that persons with disabilities include those who have long term physical, mental, intellectual and sensory impairments which in interaction with various barriers may hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. Disability is understood as an evolving concept that results from the interaction between persons with impairments and attitudinal and environmental barriers in society. This means the focus should be not only on the existence of an impairment, but on how we can remove barriers to participation and ensure people with disabilities can be independent and equal actors in society. Importantly, the CRPD therefore marks a distinct shift away from the medical and charity model approach to social and human rights based model of disability inclusive development. Now, there are a number of definitions which persons of disability include those who have long term physical, mental, intellectual or sensory impairments which in interaction with various barriers may hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. Ableism is the unfair treatment, discrimination and social prejudice of persons with disabilities. You know, ableism is rooted in the assumption and belief that persons with disability are inferior to persons without disabilities. Now, there is something called disability inclusion. Now, this is to understand the relationship between how individual function and how they participate in society and in activities in day to day life. 
It means that all persons with disability have full and fundamental rights and freedoms that place them as an integral part of society and that they enjoy full and effective participation with and within their families, communities and societies on an equal basis as those without disabilities. Now, the question comes that why disability inclusion matters with persons with disability? It makes up approximately 15 percent of the global population. Over a billion people or one in seven and this number is expected to double by two million by 2050. There are nearly 240 million children with disabilities in the world. This is one in ten children. Now, we have to understand the link between the poverty and the disability. The link between the poverty and disability is inextricable and 80 percent of the persons with disability live in low middle income countries LMIC. According to UN development program and World Bank, 20 percent of the world's poorest people have some kind of a disability. So, persons with disability are more likely to experience poverty and high rates of multiple deprivation as they are routinely excluded from mainstream health, education, economic opportunities. Being poor can also increase the likelihood of disability due to injury and disease associated with lack of nutrition, lack of clean water and unsafe environments. Now, adults and children with disability are not a homogeneous group and neither are subgroups of persons with disability such as persons who are deaf, blind or live with intellectual or physical disability. Now, what to say each individual is unique and will experience living with disability differently even when they share the same type of a disability. So, critically disability is experienced as one dimension of a person's identity which intersects with other dimensions including sex, gender identity, age, sexual orientation, religion, class, ethnicity and other characteristics. Intersectional and disability inclusive situation and power analysis tools are paramount to understand this diversity and the barriers that perpetuate the exclusion of persons with disabilities as one as the enablers that facilitate and promote disability inclusion. Now, let us unpack the disability. Now, disability refers to the limitation in functioning caused by the interaction between a person with impairment and barriers in the society. Now, let us understand the barriers. Understanding such barriers is therefore crucial as they impact on the person's ability to participate fully on an equal basis with others in the society. Now, barriers are of five types. First is the attitudinal barriers. Attitudinal barriers are the negative beliefs, stereotypes or perceptions about parents or caregivers or children with disabilities that are rooted in society or in the local culture. They create prejudice, discrimination and cause harm to persons with disabilities and limit their enjoyment of their fundamental human rights and freedoms. So, it is possible that parents and caregivers of the children with disabilities are not only the targets of the negative beliefs from society, but also themselves propagate negative beliefs and low expectations for children with disabilities. Now, examples of the attitudinal barrier would include maybe a school director who believes that the person with intellectual impairment are disruptive and are incapable of learning and thus makes these students feel unwelcome creates a barrier for person with disability to enter the school and learn. Another example would be a, of a healthcare worker who thinks that women with disability are not or should not be sexually active and thus does not provide them with family planning services creates a barrier for women with disabilities to access healthcare. The another barrier is environmental barrier. This includes physical obstacles in the natural and physical environment. Now, some of the examples for the uh, environmental barriers would include maybe a health clinic with steps at the entrance, pathways without tactile guide markers, narrow doorways and Scott style toilets create barriers for persons with physical impairment and persons with vision impairment. A few more examples of the environmental barriers are a steep hill leading to a school, a bus without a drop down platform, a toilet without a railing to hold on to, noisy classrooms and dimly lit learning spaces. Then the third one is the institutional barrier. These are the restrictions established through policy 
legislation formal structures that prevent persons with disabilities from fully participating in society on an equal basis with others. Now, some of the examples of the institutional barriers at the macro level include legislation that prevents equality before the law, right to enrollment in a public school or access to social protection as well policies that do not subsidize the cost of assistive devices, personal assistance or rehabilitation. Then we have financial barriers. These are the extra costs that a person with disability has to cover in order to participate in day to day life. Now, examples of the financial barriers include essential products a child with disability may need such as medicines or assistive devices or services such as rehabilitation or sign language interpretation. It can also mean the cost for a support worker, guide or an education aid. Finally, we have communication barriers and these are those arising when a person's preferred way of communicating, sharing and understanding information does not match how information is normally delivered. Now, examples of the communication barrier would include a distribution center with signage in small unclear font, without pictures or diagrams and without raised lettering which is braille. It creates a barrier for the persons with the vision impairment. A workshop using spoken communication without providing for sign language interpretation. This creates a barrier for persons with hearing impairments and sign language users. Similarly, a health clinic with high service counters and patient information desks creates a barrier for persons with physical impairment who is using a wheelchair. So, a website with images that do not include alternate text or when information is only in one format visual or auditory. This limits who can access and understand it. Now, let us see the interaction between impairment and barriers. Now, when a person with impairment faces barriers, it results into lack of participation. It is therefore, society that creates a disabling situation for persons with disabilities. When barriers in the person's community are removed, then person with disability is able to participate on an equal basis with others. This means that people with the same type of impairment may have completely different life depending on the barriers they face, where they live, what access they have to services and how their communities perceive and accommodate them. Now, examples of how impairment and barriers interact to create a lack of participation. Now, let us see a few examples. Now, uh, for example, the interaction of impairment functioning barriers, participation and disability. Let us say there is a 10 year old Yasin who has optic nerves are completely damaged which means they are impaired due to an eye disease and he develops difficulties in seeing which means difficulty in function. His school refuses to take him back as they do not have the resources to support a child with vision impairment. This is the attitude of the school staff. Now, this is a barrier. There are no other schools in his community and therefore, Yasin cannot go to school. Now, this is a disabling situation. Another example, due to a road accident, Radha suffered a spinal cord injury, again an impairment which resulted in her being unable to walk like before. This is difficulty in function and she starts using a wheelchair. She wants to continue her vocational training course after the accident. But the vocational training center is on the first floor of a public building with no ramp and only stairs. Now, this is built environment acting as a barrier. She therefore, is unable to complete her vocational education. This is a disabling situation. Let us see a third example. David was born with Down syndrome. This is an impairment which affected his family to understand, learn and remember. This is difficulty in function. He also has difficulties in walking, so difficulty in function again as his balance was affected. His parents never enrolled him in the school, the disabling situation as they did not think there was any point in educating him and they also feared he would be bullied. Now, this is parental attitude barrier. Now, persons with disability are often excluded directly or indirectly from development processes and humanitarian action because of physical, attitudinal and institutional barriers. The effects of this exclusion are increased inequality, discrimination, marginalization. To change this, a disability approach you having inclusion must be implemented. 
Now, here is a twin track approach which has been used by UNRWA for the inclusion of disabled. Now, let us understand what this twin track, ap track approach is all about. So, the twin track approach is used in inclusive programming to ensure that adults and children with disabilities can equally participate and benefit. So, out of these two tracks, the first track works towards making every program inclusive by mainstreaming disability inclusion within and across the programs. That is assuming that all programs can and should include and benefit those with disabilities. Now, the second track involves activities and programs that specifically support the empowerment of children and adults with disabilities with the aim of leveling the playing field challenging unequal power dynamics and supporting children and adults with disabilities to engage and participate on an equal basis with others. It involves the inclusion of specific activities for adults and children with disabilities within each program. For example, training for adolescents with disabilities on their rights under the UNCRC and UNCRPD. The two tracks reinforce each other. When mainstream programs and services such as health and education services are disability inclusive and aware, this can help facilitate both prevention of impairments as well as early identification of children and persons with disabilities who can then be referred to disability specific services. And the provision of disability specific support such as assistive devices can help facilitate more effective inclusion of persons with disability in the mainstream services. Now, how do we implement this twin track approach at the ground level? Now, which this will involve two things. Track one, mainstreaming disability as a cross cutting issue within all key programs and services. So, what are those key programs? Education, health, relief, social services, microfinance, infrastructure improvement, protection and emergency response. And to ensure these programs and services are again inclusive, equitable, non-discriminatory and do not create or reinforce barriers. So, this is done by gathering information on the diverse needs of persons with disabilities during the assessment stage. Considering disability inclusion during the planning stage, making adaptations in the implementation stage and gathering the perspectives of persons with disability in the evaluation stage. Now, track 2 that is supporting the specific needs of persons with disabilities to ensure they have equal opportunities to participate in society. So, this is done by strengthening referral to both internal and external pathways and ensuring that there are programs to provide rehabilitation, assistive devices and other disability specific services. And what can they be? The disability program for learning support program and the rehabilitation center services. So, the core approach to disability inclusion is a human rights based approach. The two key instruments gaining the effort for disability inclusion include UNCRC which guides various institutions to work for the cause of the child rights. Article 2 in the UNCRC calls for the full enjoyment of rights by all children without discrimination of any kind including the child's or his or her parents disability. Article 6 and 26 further recognize that every child has the inherent right to life and that state party shall ensure to the maximum extent possible the survival and development of the child. Article 23 of the UNCRC further details the rights of children with disabilities and includes the right to enjoy a full and decent life in conditions which ensure dignity promote self-reliance and facilitate the child's active participation in the community. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Persons with Disability which is called UNCRPD, it is the main tool to promote and ensure the rights of the persons with disabilities. So, children with disabilities are recognized throughout the UNCRPD, but specifically in article 3 general principles which states that respect for evolving capacities of children with disabilities and respect for the rights of children with disabilities to preserve their identities.
Article 7 on children with disabilities, Article 16 on freedom from exploitation, violence and abuse, Article 18 on the liberty of movement and nationality, Article 23 on respect for home and family, Article 24 on education and Article 25 on health. All also specifically address children. Now, the question is how to engage with persons with disabilities. So, the manners and the etiquettes you should extend to a person with disability should be the same as those you would convey to a person without the disability. So, however specific issues may arise in working with persons with disability where the best and the most appropriate way to interact may be less obvious. So, here are a few tips. Number one ask before you help. Do not assume that a person with disability always needs to be helped. Ask them if they would like your help and then follow their instructions on how you should help them. Second, speak directly to the person. Even if a person is using a sign language interpreter or a personal assistance, direct your conversation to the person and not to the interpreter or the assistant. Third, be conscious of physical contact. Avoid leaning on a person's wheelchair, crutches or a cane as these devices are part of their personal space and it is considered similar to leaning or hanging on to a person. So, if, if a person is with vision impairment, it needs to be guided. Do not grab their hand. Instead, offer your hand indicating where can they hold you. So, if you are meeting a person with vision impairment, always identify yourself and others who may be with you and remember to identify the person by name when conversing in a group. Do not be afraid to shake hands with people who have difficulties using their hands or those who are using artificial limbs are culturally appropriate in your culture. The next thing is to get the attention of a person who is deaf tap the person on the shoulder or wave your hand. Look directly at the person and speak clearly and slowly if the person can read your lips. Not all persons who are deaf can read the lips. So, for those who do not lip read, be sensitive to their needs by placing yourself so that you face the light source and keep hands, cigarette and food away from your mouth when you are speaking. Next thing, listen patiently and attentively when you are talking about a person who has difficulty in speaking. Avoid correcting or speaking for a person. Wait for him, have patience so that he finish and if you have not understood something, do not pretend that you have. Instead, you could repeat what you have understood and allow the person to respond. The next thing is be specific when giving directions to a person with vision impairment. For example, say in front of you, behind you, to your left, to your right instead of using the phrases over there, here, using hands or facial gestures to indicate where to go. When speaking to someone with intellectual impairment, use a plain language and speak with shorter sentences. Do not talk down to the person or treat an adult as a child when communicating. Do not be embarrassed if you happen to use common expressions such as see you later, I have got to run or did you hear about that, that seems to relate to a person's disability. And last is please ask the person when you are unsure of what to do. So, this is all we have for you today. We shall see you again with another interesting episode on inclusion. Till then take care and goodbye.